Thanks, everyone. Um, so today, I was given the job of sort of giving a kind of summary lecture. Uh, I also saw people uh, on the post-its asking for sort of more in-depth knowledge. Um, so this is kind of drilling in on some aspects of kind of the second half of my lecture on Monday when it was geography and history. Um, just more details about history. Uh, some of you I've already told bits of this to. Uh, I think out of the three institutes I've done, these were like the most intense content questions. So we'll get to get done. Um, and so I kind of wanted to consolidate and make sure everybody has some of the same information. Uh, there will hopefully be uh, time towards the end when I drill in a little bit more on aspects of medieval culture, um, many of which are in your galleries. Um, and since we're doing house sound, uh, if everybody can sort of try and be quiet um, in the middle, I will take questions every so often. Um, so, yeah. Uh, also, probably going to be a little bit longer than I would normally do. Uh, try and get through what would, in a college semester course, be six weeks of content. Um, so, yeah. Uh, so without further ado, uh, Japan and the interconnected world. Um, one of the questions we had uh, at the end of the lecture on Monday is there's sort of, you know, different ways to kind of frame this narrative. Um, and one of the ways we can certainly frame the narrative, um, with thanks to Yvette, uh, is sort of looking at Japanese history in terms of periods of increased interconnection, um, with Japan's neighbors in Asia and around the world um, versus periods of sort of uh, increased isolation. Um, for those sort of playing along at home, this is a color-adjusted photo of uh, one of the main temples in Kyoto, Kyogizadera, um, which is mentioned in, for example, the Little Book, um, and which has this very lovely Chinese-style Buddhist gate. Um, so, can you say color yeah, uh, it's not quite as bright in real life. <laughs> I hit the vivid color button on my camera. Okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So um, to give everybody the same kind of background for the terms I'm going to be throwing around and have thrown around this week, um, so sort of talking about ancient or pre-classical Japan, um, when, for example, Empress Suiko and Prince Shotoku have come up over and over and over again. Um, they were at the beginning of the Asuka period. Um, which is still considered pre-classical um, because Japan has not fully adopted this Chinese Tang style state. Um, and I see everybody taking photos. The slides will be up on the website uh, shortly. And the video will then also be up on the uh, Japan Future Institute page as well. So um, please don't feel you need to do that um, as you deeply, deeply desire to. <laughs> um, so in 710, uh, Japan gets its first permanent capital, um, which is now called Nara. At the time, it was called Heijo Kyo. Um, it's built along the, the exact same layout as uh, the town capital, Chang'an. Um, so before that, the capital had sort of moved every few years uh, in accordance with this kind of native Shinto taboo about death. So when the emperor died, the monarch died. Um, so they were called emperors then. They would shift the capital. Um, so. After they leave Nara, um, in part to get away from the extremely uh, powerful established Buddhist temples, um, they settle in the capital city of Heian Kyo. Um, and Heian, uh, which is now Kyoto, uh, is the capital until 1868. Um, so they almost made it uh, to 1100 years. They still call themselves the thousand year capital, uh, and frequently round it up to 1100 anyway. <laughs> um, so this is classical Japan. Uh, very sort of comparable to uh, classical states in Asia, uh, West Asia and Europe. Government, tax-based, uh, aristocratic culture. And it ends, as I'm sure we're all aware, uh, in 1185 with uh, the beginning of the medieval period. Medieval literally means Middle Ages, so it comes in between the classical uh, and the modern, which isn't on this slide. Um, so medieval Japan, you can kind of divide it into three sort of major eras. Um, so the first shogunate, um, the first sort of warrior government was established in Kamakura. Um, these are all place names, uh, except Senmoto. Um Kamakura is in the east. It's quite near what is now Tokyo. Um, it's the first shogunate. And when it falls, uh, the Muromachi shogunate takes its place. This is uh, named after a street in Kyoto, actually. So the shogunate is, this shogunate is headquartered in Kyoto, um, partly to try and sort of exert more control over the imperial court, um, which was still not happy about the existence of the shogunate. Um, and that all comes to an end um, in some respects uh, with the beginning of this Oni War that I mentioned in 1467. 
Um, so uh, people had actually started fighting in sort of the northeast parts of Japan uh, in the previous decade, in the 1450s. So there's 150 years of civil war, more or less. This is the Sengoku, or Warring States period. Um, and uh, the term is borrowed from Chinese history, uh, but it's, it's pretty accurate, it's pretty applicable. Um, so broadly speaking, this sort of ancient um, pre-classical and early classical period is you know, kind of when Japan's interconnection with uh, its neighbors around it is on a total upswing. Um, the Heian period witnesses sort of a turn uh, inward, less connection with uh, neighbors. For example, the Heian court, the last embassy to China, goes in 1857. Uh, they don't start again until uh, under the Muromachi, uh, in the Muromachi period under the Ashikaga. Um, but once the medieval period starts uh, and the shogunates get going, uh, they have a strong incentive to uh, engage in sort of exchanges with China again, uh, as well as other neighbors, sort of seeking alternate sources of prestige um, with which to sort of uh, set themselves up uh, as sort of equally good at artsy things as the court, but different artsy things because the court already controlled all the artsy things that existed in Japan. Okay. So, any questions about any of that? Yes. What they call the period after it. So, um, in keeping with the place name tradition, it's called the Edo period. Um, which is the uh, shogunal capital, which is now Tokyo. Um, what would it be considered? Not medieval. Early modern. Early modern. Early okay. modern. Um, basically the same as kind of uh, the Renaissance, the 1600s, 1700s in Europe. Um, a lot of comparable things happening, and in fact, uh, in the 1700s, you know, they're reading some of the same Dutch books, um, or European scientific knowledge is translated into Dutch and coming into the country then through Nagasaki. Um, so yeah, but the, the non-placing tradition, it's also called the Tokugawa period after the shogunate family that controlled it for the whole time. Okay, yes. So you described a pretty entrenched Buddhist system pretty early on. When did that contact really begin with, with China and other uh, East Asian countries? So um, with societies in China, uh, the continent and the Korean Peninsula from before sort of recorded history, mm -hmm. um, the Early, the version of this slide that sort of has stuff before this, 300 BCE is kind of the date when um, it looks like rice agriculture came over from probably Korea. Um, and that's really what sort of allows Japan to get set onto this path of sort of more complex societies. Um, so chi contact with uh, China and Korea uh, is constant, basically. Um, and it sort of ameliorates in the Heian period for the first time. 300 BCE came Yeah. 300 BC, which is very late. Um, people in Mesopotamia and Egypt, the Indus River Valley, the Huang Valley, um, they have complex agriculture, you know, in the 3000s BC. So, um, Japan is kind of a late gamer. Okay. Just one last question. What's the earliest um, archaeological evidence of human occupation in that, the, that archipelago? Like, yeah. I know the Joman upstairs talk about 8,000 Right. BC. Um, I believe there's like archaeological evidence dating back to like the 3,000s BC, like bits of sort of stone tools. Um, that's, the, that's the very earliest. Um, so it's not clear whether people were there before that or what. Um, the sort of early evidence has been very kind of argued about. Um, but definitely by about sort of 10,000 BCE, there's this established kind of Jomon culture. Um, and they, if you Google on the internet, like they have, they have like Jomon parks in Hokkaido where they've reconstructed these settlements. Um, the same people who made the sort of intricate corded pottery that's upstairs. Right. Okay. okay, I'm gonna move on. All right, uh, good questions. So in keeping with this sort of theme of incorporating influence, uh, Japan in an interconnected world, uh, we've gone on and on and on about the 17 articles of Prince Shotoku, also known as a constitution, um, more or less solely to fit needs of national prestige of when those accounts were written much later. Um, so I've also talked a lot about Empress Suiko. Um, and those of you who've taught China in your classes, um, if you were given this portrait, you would assume this is actually probably Wu Zetian. Um, you know, the single uh, em female emperor in Chinese history. Um, so this abstract, which I'm going to read, um, is actually telling the story of Empress Suiko uh, taking the throne. Um, but note that it was compiled in 714, um, and she lived sort of in the 500s. So um, 
there's going to be some elements that I'm going to uh, explain, which very clearly show that this was kind of rewritten later uh, to match uh, kind of Chinese models of what civilization and what sort of civilized monarchs and courts did. Uh, so when she, uh, being Empress Suigo, was 34 years of age in the fifth year and 11th month of the reign of the emperor, Hatsusebe, the emperor was murdered by the great imperial chieftain, Mumako no Sukune, and the succession to the dignity being vacant, the ministers besought the empress consort of the emperor, Minokura Futodamashiki, viz, uh, the Empress Nukata Bay, to ascend the throne. The empress refused, but the public functionaries urged her in memorials three times until she consented, and they accordingly delivered her the imperial seal. Um, so there's kind of some telltales here that things are sort of not actually fitting the Chinese model and have been fit um, to the Chinese model kind of retroactively. Um, the first is actually probably the fact that this emperor, the emperor was murdered. Um, by this guy who has a, also a very fancy title. Um, that's not supposed to happen in sort of a strict uh, civilizational Confucian hierarchy. Um, I should have highlighted ministers. This is kind of unclear what that means, but ministers are a feature of, of Chinese style government, so obviously there were ministers there because this is a civilized country. Um, and the key sentence is really this one, which is highlighted in these boxes. Um, so it says the empress refused, and these public functionaries, uh, these ministers, um, urged her in memorials three times until she consented. Um, which, for those who are familiar with Chinese uh, chronicles and Chinese practices, um, refusing three times is sort of uh, traditional. Uh, you have to sort of do that to show a sort of proper sense of humility. And then, um, once you have refused three times, you know, then you consent. Um, and it's very pro forma. Um, this also talking about memorials. Uh, they didn't like really have writing much then, so who, what are these memorials? But of course, a memorial is a very standard Chinese practice. It's basically kind of an open memo to the emperor from a scholar official. Um, it's also kind of unclear whether there would have been an imperial seal. Uh, that is a very Chinese thing. Um, and a seal is not among the three treasures of the imperial family. Um, so you can see here, um, with sort of a little more background knowledge, how um, in the early 700s, when this Tang state has been established in Japan, this Tang-style government, um, there's this wholesale campaign to kind of rewrite the history, um, you know, put all these people with these very long native Japanese names into this chronicle um, and to make it fit this model of what civilization was. Um, and it's not a coincidence that Suiko, in this later representation, um, is dressed entirely in Chinese-style robes, um, though probably she wouldn't have been uh, wearing them then. Um, that is probably actually what people in the Nara period dressed more like. Um, but maybe not, because this is actually also kind of a later uh, style. Um, so it's more probable that um, you know, they were wearing something closer to this. So this is Prince Shotoku and his two sons. Um, so to talk, if you want to talk about gender roles, um, this is Tang style court garb. Uh, there's not a whole sort of lot of differentiation in between what men and women wear. Um, the hairstyle of the younger children is also kind of, um, to our eyes, seems kind of uh, gender ambiguous. I think this is the one who got assassinated, the older one. Uh, he'd be at his father's right hand in the painting. Um, and those are Tang style swords that they're wearing, the sort of longer blade. Note that it's basically straight for those of us who are interested in the swords. Um, so the 17 articles of Prince Shotoku, um, also known as the Constitution, have gotten a lot of play in the standards, um, in the textbooks, but it's important to sort of realize that um, Shotoku and Suiko were living in this era of kind of increased uh, contact with China um, and with Buddhism through Korea, um, and they were sort of absorbing this whole kind of writing Buddhism government thing all at once, um, and the articles are really sort of Shotoku's kind of aspirational statement of like, this is how we should aspire to be. Um, you know, to be more like uh, the current kingdoms in Korea, to be more um, like Chinese kingdoms as well. Um, and they didn't really have a huge impact on sort of how the government was, was run. Um, it's not until sort of a couple, uh, the next sort of decades that um, this Tang government is actually sort of instituted and things actually changed in the government. Um, but one thing that did change, um, and the way in which Shotoku had an immediate a personal impact, um, is with the development of early Buddhism. Um, and for those of you who have been, I've been talking about this kind of syncretization, this uh, 
melding of Buddhism and Shinto that happens. Um, there's the Japanese term for it, the Shimbutsu Shugo, the union of Kami and Buddhas. Um, so as, as I've said before as well, um, prior to a sort of arrival of Buddhism um, in a more organized way, uh, Shinto, what we now call Shinto, didn't really exist as a codified thing. It was just kind of what everybody in the community did. Um, and it still, to a large extent, is, is what everybody in the community does. Um, just now has sort of more theory with it. Um, so one thing that starts happening is that people start um, building temples on shrine sites, because um, these are sort of, well, if we're going to build a temple, which is a sacred building, we have this place, this site that already is considered sacred, so um, very obviously building them there, um, which very quickly means that shrines and temples become joint complexes. They remain joint complexes until the 1870s. Um, so, you know, more than 1,300 years later. Um, and the shrines take on uh, the characteristics of this Buddhist organization of sacred spaces, um, which the biggest impact immediately is that they now have built structures. Um, so they have shrine <coughs> walls, um, whereas before they were sort of formerly open air sites, um, most likely marked out with that kind of sacred rope with the paper hanging off of it, which you've probably seen in photos. Um, <coughs> And more broadly, as part of all this, an overarching, uh, the importation of Buddhism as a concept, um, as a set of ideas, um, also impacted the definition of Shinto, um, and in, in fact sort of gave rise to Shinto being defined as Shinto, um, and as a sort of distinct thing, as opposed to just kind of this uh, amorphous set of practices. Um, and when Christianity comes in in the 18, uh, 1800s as well, um, it kind of also has a similar impact on the way people in Japan conceptualize religion. Um, so there are sort of some recurrent patterns in Japanese history, and that's kind of um, part of one of them. Okay, um, take a break for water. Any questions about any of that? Um, I know in China, uh, Buddhism rose and fell in favor with the government. Did it ever rise and fall? Like, did it ever get outlawed in Japan, or was it always steady once it got accepted? It is never outlawed in Japan. Um, it does quite well, um, especially in the Tokugawa period when um, the shogunate makes everybody register through Buddhist temples. Um, unfortunately, that very directly sets it up for persecution in the Meiji period. Um, the Meiji oligarchs were very influenced by this uh, school of nativist Shinto thought that had grown up in the Tokugawa era, which regarded Buddhism as a foreign sort of importation, not native uh, to Japan. Um, so the Meiji government is the one that forces the divorce of the Kamis and Buddhas. Um, and so these complexes are given a choice, like be Shinto or be Buddhist. Um, and there was a lot of pressure to choose being Shinto. Um, and, but it, it's, never, it's never like persecuted. Um, it, that's not true. It is persecuted in the 1870s. It's never outlawed or anything. Unlike Christianity, which was outlawed for more than 250 years, um, new religions in the 1800s um, and 1900s were also persecuted. Um, to some extent, until the post-war constitution. Um, but this is actually kind of a problem and, and sort of sets up some things that happened during um, the Asia-Pacific War, um, is that Buddhism then is sort of given this powerful incentive to like serve the state and to prove its loyalty to the state. Um, and so Buddhist priests become sort of pretty, pretty heavily involved with um, the Japanese Empire's military expeditions and imperialism. Um, so speaking of unintended consequences. <laughs> Okay, um, so along with Buddhism came writing. Um, and one of the things I've talked about uh, is uh, sort of the importance of poetry to Japanese society before the introduction of writing. Um, as soon as they get writing, the first thing they do is use it to write down um, poetry, which is a hugely important social practice um, up until the 20th century. Um, and it becomes particularly important during the Heian era. Um, I've also mentioned uh, this woman, Empress Jito, um, several times. Um, so she reigned uh, in her own right um, from 686 to 697, um, but she was actually on the throne as the consort of her uh, spouse uh, earlier. They win a civil war in the early 680s, um, which is basically about sort of how far the Taifa reforms, this sort of establishment of this Tang style government are going to go. They are the very much centralizing uh, couple and uh, their rival loses, um, which creates real problems with people writing about this uh, in the Meiji period um, when there's this ideology of imperial uh, continuity. Um, but and sh as far as scholars can tell, Jito is actually the first person to be addressed um, by the Chinese term Tenno, uh, emperor, um, son of heaven, uh, in her lifetime. 
um, as opposed to sort of everybody else in Chronicles to whom it's applied before that, um, that's a retroactive designation. Um, so, for example, Suiko, in that example I read earlier, um, it, recall, recalls her, it calls her the Empress, but in actual fact, her title would have been more like Great Monarch um, and then a whole bunch of other long stuff. So, um, and in ter terms of poetry, uh, it's kind of difficult to include in the middle school curriculum, but um, here is sort of one example of it. Um, this is actually a poem by Jito herself, and it's in one of the famous uh, poetic anthologies, the Hyakunin Ishu, so that's 100 poets, one poem each. Um, so the translation is on the left, and the uh, modern writing of it with the old style spelling is on the right. Um, so it's Harusugite Natsuki ni Kerash Shirotai no Koromo Hoscho Ama no Kaguyama, which is something close to the classical uh, pronunciation, maybe. Um, so the spring has passed and the summer come again, for the silk white robes, so they say, are spread to dry on Mount Kaguyama. Um, so this is the walk, the standard waka style uh, meter, 57577. Um, when Basho invents haiku in the Edo period, he just lops off the bottom two, <laughs> then you have 575. Um, so this is one of the earliest poetic meters that exists, um, the classic Japanese poem. And this is her um, from a later anthology, and then this is the poem transcribed um, using all characters, actually. So, not characters, excuse me, uh, the syllabary. So this is Hiragana. Um, so this state that Jito um, and her forebears were sort of establishing um, is called by historians the Ritsuryo state, which means like the legal code state. Um, so it's a classical state, um, sort of this Chinese bureaucratic model. Um, it combines that with a sort of pre-existing familial, familial system of power creating this oversized state, um, which is to say that there's kind of more bureaucracy than Japan um, in terms of its population really needs. Um, and if you remember the smallpox epidemic article from earlier, um, especially after the smallpox epidemic, there's like way too much government for the number of people that are there. Um, so the fear of invasion is really what motivates this. Um, there's a strong fear that either uh, Korean kingdoms, uh, Koguro, which unifies the uh, country, um, or the Tang Dynasty itself, um, which is allied with Koryo, are going to invade Japan um, in the mid-600s. So the principal Chinese uh, elements they take are a census, a system of land redistribution where um, the government was said to own all the land and it was assigned to cultivators for life cultivation rights. Um, that breaks down like almost immediately, like by after the smallpox epidemic, essentially. Um, so court offices, there's this elaborate system of nine ranks, um, nine, there's always nine, as she would um, say, of you know, various government offices. Um, there's a tax system. Um, so for the first time, people are sort of notionally paying taxes to the central government. Um, and of course, the layout of the capital city itself. And the principal ways this was changed to fit the Japanese context um, as we said before, as I've uh, talked about with several of you, no civil service examination system. Um, it's a danger to this sort of concept of inherited power, um, so they just don't bring it in. Um, so they're still gonna run things based on birth. Um, and the other uh, key thing, well, two other key things. Uh, so unlike in China, which has this concept of the mandate of heaven, which basically says that if the dynasty goes bad, you're justified in trying to overthrow it, um, there's no such thing. Um, the imperial family uh, claims to be descended from the sun goddess. Um, they are not going to surrender that source of prestige by saying, like, no, sometimes it's okay to overthrow us. Um, so this does not apply in China. Um, and the most, one of the most consequential is also the fact that um, temples um, and people who, um, it's usually called reclaiming land, but it's, it's actually terraforming, um, sort of bringing land into cultivation. So people who um, bring land onto the tax rolls are actually made exempt from taxation, um, at least you know notionally lifetime, but that becomes functionally eternal. Um, so the result of that um, is that over time, from the sort of beginning of the Nara period, um, and especially picking up steam in the medieval period, um, private lands uh, basically sort of become more and more prevalent um, there's various strategies people use to take land off the government tax rolls um, and put it into their sort of private, non-taxable possession. Um, and so these aristocratic families, uh, many of whom sort of hereditarily wind up associated with government offices, 
um, despite the fact that they have these sort of public roles, uh, they act in their private interest to take this land off of the tax rolls. Um, so that undermines the government's treasury. Um, and over the sort of very long sweep of Japanese history, um, it also ultimately jeopardizes uh, their own status. Um, so that's kind of, I could go on and on and on for multiple lectures about land and income rights. I don't want to say too much more about it because it's very complicated. Um, but the central point here is taxes. And one thing that sort of characterizes the sort of classical era um, is that people are paying taxes to the central government. Um, technically, they're usually doing it through like tax farmers. Um, it's not like where we can e-pay the IRS. Um, but taxes versus rents is a huge sort of distinction between classical and medieval. Um, so I sort of want to make the point that there's notionally paying centralized taxes, but over time everybody wants to not pay taxes. Um, and they don't, there's no real sort of effective strategy to combat this. Um, and that sort of is the thing that kind of eventually brings down this classical state. Um, though it takes a very long time for people to finally agree to just admit that it's done with. Okay. Um, yes. Can I just go back to the previous slide and the yeah. point you made about poetry and language together? Were you talking about Hiragana? Because my, maybe I misunderstood that um, I thought that Chinese characters as kanji predated Tang Dynasty and right. Japanese relations, right? Yeah, so um, writing emerges in China in, during the Shang Dynasty with the oracle bones. It's all characters. Comes to Japan with Buddhism in the 500s. Um, by the sort of early 800s, it's been adopted from characters they've created two syllabaries, um, which are suited for writing the Japanese language. Um, characters are a very bad match for Japanese, because um, Japanese and Chinese are kind of opposite grammatically. Um, which is not to say, before the ex existence of the syllabary, before those were invented, um, they did use characters to write uh, Japanese. The Manyoshu, for example, the earliest of the imperial anthologies, um, which is also entirely a poetry anthology, that's all characters. Um, written in kind of this extremely archaic, um, sort of collect hodgepodge of writing styles, um, and it's known as Manyogana. Um, and people ignored the Manyoshu for a really long time. They were wrong. Poetry is really cool. Uh, it's just extremely hard to read because sometimes people will be writing with acrostics, other times they're doing this, and other times it's that, um, because there wasn't kind of a lot of conventions about writing, but they knew they wanted to write manual. So the silver is kind of what? Like by roughly 800 or so, um, Kobo Daishi, the famous Buddhist monk, is traditionally credited with inventing both of them, but it's extremely unlikely that it was just one person. Um, it, in historically speaking, in terms of inventing writing systems, very few of them can be traced to one or even a few single people. Um, the Korean syllabary, however, hung, alphabet, excuse me, um, the Korean alphabet, however, is different. Um, that does have a distinct origin. Yes. You said that. Basho invented haiku? I knew he was considered he invented. invented it. Um, but he he did he was kind of one of the early perfectors right. of the form. And they say he may also have been a new secret ninja. Like, <laughs> why else was he wandering around Japan so freely in an era when you needed travel passes from the right. shogun? Um, that's a good question. I'm not actually sure whether Basho actually invented haiku, but he definitely kind of was like was the early master, master yeah. of the form. Um, okay. No. Okay. Good. So, um, moving into the sort of Heian period, the high classical age. Um, the Heian Japan is this period of fewer connections um, with neighboring countries, partly because um, on the continent, the Tang Dynasty is in trouble. They fall in the early 900s. Japan, uh, China enters this period of disunification. Um, and the Japanese cu culture is sort of flourishing. They have syllabaries now, so they can write uh, their own language more easily. Um, the tax base is sort of doing okay. There's a lot of surplus going around, um, which the aristocrats sort of promptly plow into their own cultural pursuits, um, which, you know, tale of Genji, all of that is kind of the ideal of how things were supposed to be. Um, so these are the two capitals after Nara. Um, this is actually uh, to scale. So here's Nagaoka, um, which is now sort of southwestern Kyoto. Um, this was a capital for 10 years uh, under the same emperor, Kamu. Um, and then for reasons that still remain unclear, uh, by 794 they decided they're going to move up um, a little further up the river um, to what is now modern Kyoto. Um, and those of you who've been there, um, you can, I'll, I'll talk, talk, to more, talk more about this in a minute, but um, you can see how this layout kind of doesn't fully match what's left. 
for reasons. Um, you can also see how it's kind of shifted west from where the modern city is. This is the Congo Valley, which kind of runs through um, the sort of center, and there's all these famous temples and these hills. Um, because the Congo Valley flooded so much, and they didn't have really effective flooding mitigation strategies, um, it's actually the city shifted to the west. Um, so, but you can see in both how they have this sort of very uh, same uh, grid style layout with these wide avenues. Um, this is probably why Japan, uh, Kyoto and Nara are some of the only cities with street names in Nara because they are old enough to have street names. So, um, and here's a topogra topographical construction of Kyoto, probably a, a, from around 900. Um, so there's the river, this is the palace, this is the main avenue. This temple is still here, this one's gone. Um, Nijojo, for those who are aware, is roughly in this area now. Um, over time, the city sort of changed pretty rapidly, but this is how it was supposed to be uh, in the classical era. Um, so Shofu talked about paper and its artistic qualities. I thought I'd kind of give a really good example of a very fine medieval uh, edition of Kokinshu, which is another poetic anthology um, compiled by Imperial Order in 920. Um, so this is a really good example of how, um, you know, Shofu is talking about paper and its artistic qualities and how you are supposed to choose a good paper um, for what you were writing. Um, this has sort of this gold uh, gold plates and also I think it has a lot of silver inlaid. Um, and then there's also kind of these mulberry extrusions from the paper making process, which are regarded um, as aesthetically pleasing. Um, so you were supposed to sort of look at the whole paper, whole page, like not just as a text, it's not just a sort of a blank feature for the poem, but you know, the paper has this interactive, uh, this artistic quality that interacts with the text and the calligraphy. Um, so that's cool. Um, and I've mentioned also the pillow book as well. Um, so this is a sh photo from Inari Shine from a couple years ago, and here's one of the sections where she talks about this uh, experience, which you can still have today. Um, so written by this famous courtier, uh, Sei Shonagon. Um, you have an urge to go on a pilgrimage to Inari Shrine, and as you're laboriously gasping your way up the steep mountainside of the Noodle Shrine, you're filled with admiration to see others who obviously started behind you, both climbing straight up and up in the effort. When you arrive, there they stand, already at their worship. <laughs> and these days, they're frequently, you know, women in high heels, or little old ladies. But, no. Um, so this was written in sort of the, the late uh, 900s, in the 990s, um, and some parts of it, for example this one, are uh, still extremely relevant. Um, and others are sort of very, like, how did they live? Um, but there's this extremely developed sort of co court culture um, with men and women both using poetry to communicate. Um, and the pillow book uh, has actually bits of poems in it, and of course, so does The Tale of Genji, which was the world's first novel written at the same court uh, in the same time. Okay, um, so what happens? Well, um, things fall apart. Uh, and there's some terms I've sort of uh, thrown around, and I think some are also familiar from your texts. Um, so this retired emperor system, um, the retired emperors sort of con decided to start controlling the family, imperial family's personal resources. Um, they start issuing their own government edicts because um, they want to compete with the Fujiwara family, which controls the sort of actual emperor through marriage politics. Um, so this sort of becomes an increasing factor of life at court um, from kind of the 1050s or so. Um, so as part of the competition between the retired emperor and the Fujiwara, um, both sides bring in these warrior families in the 1100s um, from the provinces, both to sort of deal with disturbances in the provinces, and then also increasingly to kind of um, kind of wage these proxy skirmishes um, in the cap capital itself. Um, and so what happens is that one particular warrior family, the Tyra, um, actually ally with the retired emperor at the time. Uh, I have a photo of all these people in a minute. Um, and uh, Tyra sort of take over all these government offices. They oust the Fujiwara from their traditional places. Nobody likes them. Um, the descendants of the other warrior, main warrior family uh, raise the flag of rebellion. Um, the retired emperor switches sides. Five years of fighting, sort of most of it inconclusive. Um, but it results in uh, the establishment of a shogunate uh, in Kamakura. Um, and the head of that, it, branch of government is granted this title of shogun. Um, so Yoritomo is the guy who actually was the first shogun. Um, so the shogun is the head of the Bakufu, the military administration, um, and the full title means great generalissimo who expels the barbarians. Shogun's the short form. 
Um, and the Bakufu is the military administration, um, which from 1185 takes an increasing role in the country's governance. Um, originally, they're just supposed to be managing the warriors, um, but the warriors are now sort of trying to get income rights for land throughout the country. So um, because of that, they kind of wind up taking an increasingly large role um, in politics at large. So here's a map of the Genpei Wars. You can see how it's mostly the western half of the country. So there's Kyoto, and there's Kamakura. Uh, this is the last battle, a sea battle in Danno, uh, Danno Ura. Um, Shikoku, last, uh, the tiny island, which is where the Taira survivors flee. Um, when I lecture solely on this, it's like, did anything happen in 1185? Well, some things happened. Um, <laughs> others maybe were overblown. Um, but to the point of like the question of sort of warrior dominance versus the court, um, the warriors really wanted to be like acknowledged by the court as kind of aesthetic equals in these skills. Um, so if you, in fact, if you look at these three portraits, uh, so this is Taira no Kiyomori, um, who dies horribly and is really thought to be suffering in hell um, because he ordered the burning of Todaiji and Nara um, in retaliation against the monks. Uh, this is the retired emperor, Go Shirakawa, uh, who sort of kind of started the whole thing. Um, and this is the guy who wins, uh, Minamoto no Yori Komo. Um, they're all wearing, these two are in Buddhist uh, robes. He is wearing sort of traditional court garb. Um, most self-portraits of warriors or portraits of warriors portray them sort of in this traditional courtly fashion as opposed to emphasizing their military accomplishments. Um, they very much wanted this kind of classical prestige. Um, so just a few more kind of illustrative photos about the Genpei Wars. This is where the first battle took place, um, the Byodoin in uh, Uji. Um, if you have a ten, a 10 yen coin, this is actually the building on the 10 yen coin. Um, and this is also one of the few surviving examples of Heian architecture. Um, somehow it didn't burn down in the battle, which is pretty cool. Um, and speaking of Kiyomori, um, who gets a really badass death scene in the tale of KK, um, his body starts smoking. He's, over, he's all, still alive, but he's already burning up from being in hell, from uh, <laughs> having uh, ordered Todaiji burned. Um, this is a ukiyo-e print depicting his death. So there he is in the middle suffering. There's his wife. Uh, there's a courtier in traditional garb. Um, and you can already see the, the demons of the hell gods come to be like, hey man, time to go. <laughs> um, so they pour water on his body and it steam, flashes to steam. Um, he suffers for days. It's pretty great. <laughs> <laughs> but it ends um, with this battle at Don Laura. This is actually from a slightly earlier skirmish preferable prefer before that battle. Um, but so here are the Taira fleeing to the sea. They're being routed by the Minamoto. Um, there's serious uh, the fan story, Nasu no Yoichi, that is actually happening right now. Um, so various uh, episodes from the Heike uh, epic are being portrayed uh, on the same screen. Um, so after that, um, we get into the medieval period. Um, and sort of what makes the medieval, um, I sort of, I think feudalism and talking about it is kind of actually, it works in some ways, um, but I sort of prefer to talk about uh, taxes versus rents and how this classical centralized state um, shifts from kind of collecting taxes um, to a more decentralized uh, political situation in which the majority of people are paying rents to sort of local lords. Um, and then when you put it in these terms, it's also very comparable to what happens in Europe from about sort of, you know, 400 to sort of maybe 1200 or so. Um, and the major trend both in Japan and in Europe um, is this decentralization um, and fragmentation of political power. Uh, and the classical state kind of um, increasingly breaks down in Japan. Um, so it's important to note that sort of that people still kind of pay a lot of wood service to it. It still sort of takes up a lot of mental real estate as the way things should be. Um, and that takes a very long time to stop being important. Um, but at the same time, uh, there's a growth of commerce and trade um, internally and then also externally. Um, so this is a period of which rising interconnection uh, is sort of now a thing again. Um, the warriors are looking for new cultural forms and institutions um, which they can bring to Japan or invent um, so that they can patronize them. Um, and Zen is the huge sort of example of this. Uh, Zen is uh, Chan Buddhism in China, um, and the war warriors, sort of elite warriors, bring it over um, as a sort of competing new sect of Buddhism which they can patronize because the existing sects of, patron of Buddhism are being patronized by established power holders. Um, which is why if you go to Kamakura, um, people will sometimes tell you, 
um, that the Triforce symbol from Zelda, uh, the same thing. <laughs> you'll see it all over Kamakura, and you're like, oh, it's a Zen, a Zen symbol. This is wrong. It's the crest of the Hojo, uh, which was the family that was uh, took over the Kamakura shogunate as regents. Um, so their crest is all over these temples because they uh, they were all built with Hojo patronage. Um, so these temples provided a way for sort of uh, warriors to patronize Buddhism, um, and also provided sort of an alternate way for sons of warriors, fam warrior families, to kind of have power um, by entering these Buddhist structures. So um, becoming monks and head abbots and such. Um, so are they competing culturally as well as militarily then amongst each other to kind of who has the best of the great? Yeah, um, you know, and the Similar hope is that yeah. like, um, you know, the court would be like, yes, you're right. You're not just a bunch of country bumpkins who know how to whack people with swords. Um, <laughs> you're the culture too. Um, and to some extent it works, and to others it doesn't. Um, the imperial court is sort of very snobby. Um, but. One of the things that goes along with this, um, as part of this happens, um, is over time, um, as the medieval period gets keeps going, um, and sort of more people are kind of fighting with each other for uh, land rights and income rights. Um, in the in the early sort of in the Heian era and before, and this goes back to sort of ancient Japan, um, people were kind of organized in terms of social identity into these vertical structures. So you know. Uh, a group of peasants would sort of be attached to a village that was attached to sort of a, te a certain temple um, or a certain temple that was part of a temple complex. Um, so as, if you think of that kind of social pyramid with the king at the top, um, you know, in fact, there would be kind of these vertical lines uh, intersecting kind of the people below the monarch. Um, over time, as the medieval period uh, gets going and these older structures break down, um, people tend to sort of start thinking of themselves um, in terms of like group class um, or status. So more of a horizontal kind of identification. Um, so previously in Kyoto, for example, people tended to identify themselves as like, you know, which temple they were a part of or, you know, which sort of patronage group they worked for. Um, you know, if, if your artisan group served a certain aristocratic family or if you served a warrior clan. Um, but over time, by the end of the medieval period, people are much more likely to identify as like, oh, I'm an artisan, or I'm a, I'm a merchant, you know, I'm a, I'm a Kyoto townsperson. Um, so there's more sort of higher, uh, high horizontal class-based um, allegiance happens. Um, and this goes along with sort of village cooperatives as well, that just get more important as time goes on. A whole other thing, uh, which we don't have time to talk about. Um, but as part of the warrior's sort of thirst for new stuff, um, and as also sort of this rising medieval uh, cult, uh, commerce, um, that also uh, leads to this rise of more interconnection with other uh, neighboring states. Um, so John's lesson, for example, which talked about trade um, and swords with China and other things, um, that's from this era. Um, this is the first time when, for example, people from Japan sort of have contact with kind of people from like, the South, South Seas, um, sort of further south um, as part of the rise of the main, no, excuse me, yeah. Um, so yeah, uh, there's a lot sort of going on in terms of uh, the medieval economy. Um, so uh, Eurasia on the eve of the Mongols, just to sort of give us a kind of uh, familiarity. Uh, it's a nice little Eurasia, isn't it nice? <laughs> there's, there's Japan all over on the edge. Um, we have the Song Dynasty. Uh, there's various uh, nomadic uh, groups, the Jurchen Dynasty. Um, kind of semi-nomadic kingdoms are down here, et cetera, et cetera. For, for sixth and seventh grade teachers, it's all very familiar. Um, and I really like this next gift because it's extremely dramatic. Um, here's what happens. Uh, there we go. Here's what happens with the Mongols. Wow. Wow. All right. So it's going to play again. The red is when it was all one unified Mongol empire, and then the final thing is uh, these four separate competing kingdoms, kind of very comparable to Alexander the Great and how his empire split after his death. Um, so you can see that they've sort of finished digesting China um, by 1279. Um, not coincidentally, you know, once uh, the Song do finally fall um, is when uh, the Mongols sort of think about um, invading Japan. Um, and the fall of the Kamakura Shogunate uh, a couple decades later is actually directly connected to um, the sort of rising discontentment that was called by, uh, caused partly by um, 
the fact that um, the land rights are sort of already all assigned, so the samurai who fought well um, in the repelling the Mongols felt that they were sort of not given their fair share of rewards afterward. And the, the shogunate, uh, the regent actually, um, because the power had devolved to the uh, regional regent family, the Hojo, um, they're like, there's nothing else. What do you want? Stop. Um, nobody's satisfied. Uh, least of all, uh, the emperor Go Daigo, um, which means Daigo II. Um, he is very much sort of resentful of the fact that this warrior um, bureaucracy exists at all. He plots several times to sort of overthrow the, the shogunate um, before he finally finds uh, a good, a good success, a good partner, uh, and succeeds. So he finds this sort of warrior, Ashikaga Takauji, um, who's kind of a, a military governor within the shogunate. Um, so together they uh, overthrow the Kamakura Bakufu. There is a brief restoration um, in which Godaigo is, in fact, exercising direct power as the emperor, not as the retired emperor. Um, but he's really kind of peremptory. Nobody likes him. He doesn't treat Ashikaga Takauji very well. Um, so eventually, after he's offended essentially everyone, um, Ashikaga betrays him, um, and then he, Go Daigo, is overthrown in 1337. Um, so Ashikaga Takuji establishes the second shogun. Um, Go Daigo flees to the south. Um, there's actually, for about 60 years, a period in which there are two competing emperors. Um, and this really sort of weakens the imperial family as a political uh, force. Um, so there's no more retired emperors after this, or if they are, they're like not exercising political power. They're just, you know, taking Buddhist vows and kind of living quietly. Um, and because of this sort of two competing courts, both claiming to be the legitimate emperor, um, it really kind of takes the imperial family out of the uh, political game. Um, and not coincidentally, this is also why the second shogunate is headquartered in Kyoto. So they want to keep an eye on the emperor. Um, and also make sure that like their emperor doesn't get kidnapped by people supporting this other emperor. Um, okay, so let me take questions here. We're doing okay. All right, we'll keep going. So um, medieval culture, um, which really sort of picks up uh, in the 1200s as involving kind of a distinct sensibility um, and features. Um, so as part of this increase in social upheaval, um, medieval culture becomes marked by this sort of exploration of existential questions about old certainties, kind of uh, a genuine sense of melancholy, as opposed to the Heian period when they were kind of just putting it on. Um, and medieval Buddhism, aside from Zen, um, is increasingly obsessed with sort of this new phenomenon, this older phenomenon which becomes very emphasized of Buddhist hells um, and divine punishments uh, in the afterlife for your wrongs in this one. Um, this is not sort of in denial of sort of the idea of trying to get out to enlightenment, but then they sort of like to say, well, you know, you have to suffer before going on to your next life. Um, so you're gonna suffer in hell. There's some really great hell scrolls um, <laughs> that are uh, held by various temples. Um, at the same time, um, you get new art forms arising through warrior patronage, um, such as no drama, um, landscape gardening, so dry gardens, the rocks in particular, um, those arise through warrior patronage. The rock gardens are particularly Zen, um, originally. Um, and tea culture, which we talked about the, how the first kind of tea culture was very into collecting like very conventionally uh, pretty things, which is to say like ceramics from China. Um, so like very conventionally beautiful ceramics from China, which are very expensive, you have to import them, aren't as so cultured and rich. Um, other new cultural practices, um, which have kind of a small group social dimension. Um, so one that's particularly important is Renga poetry, um, which is where two or more poets will sort of compose an interlinked series of waka um, on same themes. So you have to sort of um, interact socially with the, per with the other poet as opposed to contests, which are kind of um, adversarial. Um, tea itself, of course, is this sort of small group social thing. Um, and also itinerant performers, such as the people who went around performing the uh, Heike, um, they also sort of had, their performances had a kind of small group social atmosphere. Um, and the other thing to be aware of is that much of what we now think of as traditional Japanese culture <coughs> actually is medieval. Um, so tea, for one, tea was totally unknown in China and Japan before about uh, 1270 or so. Um, tatami mats, not a thing in the Heian period. It's part of why the buildings are so damn cold and they had to wear 12 layers of kimono. Um, architecture, another part of why the buildings are really cold in the Heian period. 
Um, they didn't have sliding doors, sort of interior partitions beside screens. Um, those become a thing in um, architecture in the medieval period, um, including alcoves. We talked about how there's always the alcove in the tea room. That architectural feature didn't exist um, before the medieval era. Um, dry gardens, etc., etc. Um, cuisine also starts evolving to sort of more what we recognize as traditional now um, than before. Yes. Is this also the time of the Kabuki is later. Kabuki is like um, late 1500s and the early 1600s is when it gets going. Um, so Kabuki is kind of seen as like a low class form of no, um, because no has this reputation of being very slow and very contemplative. Um, and Kabuki is like much more lively, comparatively speaking. So if we went, if, we, if you go to it now, you're still. It takes kind of time to appreciate like the pace, and then it's actually fairly action packed. Yeah. Um, so I have a couple examples of sort of medieval culture. Um, and one of the most famous is uh, the Hojoki, um, the record of a 10-foot hut. Um, so it's written by this guy, Kamo no Chome, who is this depressed aristocrat. aristocrat. Um, he was passed over for promotion. He took Buddhist vows. He goes off to live in a hut. Um, and he's partly depressed about kind of the, you know, the rise of the warriors and the decreasing prestige of the aristocracy. Um, so it was written in 1212. Uh, he was born in probably the late 1150s. Um, and this is the opening line. Uh, if you can recite this in classical Japanese, businessmen and bars will buy you drinks. <laughs> um, but in English, uh, the current of the flowing river does not cease, and yet the water is not the same as before. The foam that floats on stagnant pools, now vanishing, now forming, never stays the same for long. So, too, it is with the people and dwellings of the world. It's very sad. Um, and that's a reconstruction of his hut. Um, uh, I'm not, not going to read the whole Kenko excerpt, you can read it later, um, or you can read the whole Sture de Uigusa for yourself, um, Essays in Idleness. Um, very similar to, to Kamado Chome, Kenko is an aristocrat um, who uh, takes Buddhist, Buddhist vows and becomes a monk. He probably dies sometime around 1350. Um, so he's depressed about the upheavals of the Ashikaga shogunate, um, and the even further decreased uh, prestige of the aristocracy 150 years later. Um, but the first sentence is very uh, sort of uh, telling. Um, if our life did not fade and vanish like the dews of Adashino's grave, or the drifting smoke from Tori Bay's burning grounds, but lingered on forever, how little the world would move us. It is the ephemeral nature of things that makes them wonderful. Um, on the last sentence, it is most sanely to die before 40th of the list. <laughs> so, Uh, they actually found um, in Kansas City, uh, a group of students actually uh, composed a uh, group renga, I think high school students in 2011. Um, so this is an ext extract from it um, in English. It's pretty cool. Um, so uh, this city of song, bird gave birth to bebop here. Now bullets blast loud. Composing dark symphonies played for lifeless brown bodies. Kansas City knows terror is a tricky tune. Like America, we still want to dance. We just need to remember the moves. Oh, wow. mm. um, so these are so this is two uh, interlinked uh, verses. So here's five seven five seven seven. That's one, and then here's the second one. Um, so this form became increasingly popular in the medieval period. Um, literary culture spreads to the provinces as aristocrats become increasingly impoverished, um, especially after the Onin War. They kind of have to go out and become in-house poets for warriors um, because uh, there's nothing to eat <laughs> in the capital. They can't get money from their estates anymore. Um, so no drama. Uh, this is a photo from a beginning of an outdoor no performance in Kyoto in 2011 um, at Heian Shrine. Uh, I couldn't take photos during the performance, but you know, at night they light these torches. They're sort of flickering torch fires, uh, very uh, atmospheric. These two are the uh, mascots of Kyoto, if you're wondering what those strange egg things are. Uh -huh. there. Um, and these are shrine priests who are sort of involved. No started at shrines, um, which of course were also temples, and was very closely connected to sort of older sacred dances and religious rituals. Um, as part of that, people wore masks. The actors wore masks so they could better embody um, the archetypes they were portraying in some respects. Um, so here's a demon, here's a woman. All the actors are men. Um, and uh, this is a photo from an actual, during a performance, you can see better. Um, so they have sort of more light. Um, but there's sort of people on the stage. There's an actress, uh, actor, excuse me, portraying uh, a female role. 
and then the uh, musicians providing the very religious style music that is the uh, uh, soundtrack, essentially. Um, and the important thing about No is that it was uh, flourished under warrior patronage, and it was invented um, largely by sort of uh, people who were actually kind of from the at margins of society. Um, so Zayami is one of the early No um, sort of theorists and experts. Um, the Ami uh, suffix is related to the fact that he originated as a kawaramono, a sort of riverbank person, um, which is literally what it means. So outside the social structure, um, that brought into it and, and granted, uh, he was able to take vows under uh, the patronage of the shogun, uh, him and his son. Um, and a couple of other sort of famous artisans from the, from the medieval era, um, including some rock garden experts, uh, they all had this telltale Ami uh, element to their names, which signifies their origins. Um, so in some ways, the medieval social structure was um, increasingly fluid. Um, and people who were sort of you know, outside of traditional power uh, structures um, did have some uh, ability to kind of enter into them through sort of expert in expertise in um, arts and other things, um, which is something that would have not happened in the classical era for sure. Um, uh, any questions about any of that? Can um, women do no and could we now? Um, that's a good question. Uh, traditionally, no. Um, but I think there are like amateur you no know, groups that do have women. Um, there's also um, sort of by the middle of the Edo period this thing, thing called third rate kabuki evolves, um, which is um, it's kind of like the vaudeville kind of style of kabuki, you know. Um, and that does have women, and there are troops, mixed gender troops, who go around and perform this sort of third rate kabuki. They can't do it in an established uh, theater though, because then the shogunate would be mad at them. Um, traditionally, no, um, for both, however. Kabuki, of course, however, was invented by a woman um, and was performed um, mostly by actresses. Uh, the samurai got too into the actresses and the shogunate worried they would sort of neglect their duties. Um, so they said, well, okay, it has to only be men. Um, and then the samurai started going after the, boy, the teenage boys playing the women's parts. Um, so it didn't really work. <laughs> Uh, and not, neither did banning the samurai from Kabuki. They just put on these elaborate hoods and everybody sort of agreed to pretend they weren't samurai. <laughs> um, other questions? So samurai were actors? Is that what you're Samurai talking? are all through. Um, they sort of become a thing in the 1100s. Um, but after 1600, actually after 1590, samurai becomes a status group, a legal status. Like we have, the equivalent in our society is like citizen versus like non-citizen essentially. You know, citizen, green card holder. Um, people who are here undocumented. Um, that gives you like sort of de de certain legal rights. Um, and samurai becomes a status group um, that is actually at the top of the status order in the Tokugawa era. Um, so, which is how I can say and be correct that half of samurai were women in the early modern era because it was a hereditary legal status. So when you're saying that like samurai wearing hoods and people just pretended like it was okay, <laughs> that was during the era when samurai going, it was just a legal Going to the yeah. theater, not acting in it. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Oh, okay. thank you. Yes, right, exactly. No, the samurai must be samurai. Um, but what that means becomes a problem. Um, so here are sort of some shots about medieval Buddhism. Um, this is the great Buddha of Kamakura. Um, before a major tsunami, um, this was actually in a housing, um, but the housing sur uh, did not survive a large tsunami. Before 311, people didn't believe that story. Um, after 311, they did. Um, this is a bad picture of the Hojo crest uh, at a Zen temple in Kamakura. So you can see it here, the Triforce. It is the exact Triforce from Zelda. <laughs> <laughs> Nintendo took it from history. Uh, it's also on these and cap tiles. Um, and this is a Zen temple garden um, detail from the same temple. Uh, so there's a pond and sort of other structures. Um, different Zen temple in Kamakura, there's many. Uh, this is a monumental gate. There's some people for scale. Um, this is kind of a very uh, medieval Chinese style of architecture. Um, tea, which we've discussed endlessly, um, but there's sort of tea bowl, the water, the whisk, the tea powder. Um, and this is a detail of a dry uh, garden at a Zen temple in Kyoto. Um, I think actually Rianji, the super famous one. Uh, and then this is also an extremely famous uh, dry landscape garden in Kyoto. Um, this is the one 
of like about ah uh, uh, um, the sort of sound of the universe. Um, you're supposed to sort of kind of sit there. Um, there's 13 rocks in the garden, but no matter where you sit, you can only see 12. Um, and contemplating this is supposed to kind of snap you out of your normal thinking and help you understand enlightenment, um, which is the purpose of those weird riddles that Zen asks. It's like trying to get you to question your everyday perceptions, um, like Mark Blum was saying. Yes. So where did the dry gardens come? I mean, where did that, did it have a previous idea that it evolved out of, or? Um, it definitely comes from China in some aspects, but like, um, it evolves pretty quickly to be a pretty elaborate art form in Japan. Um, there's not like really much Buddhism left in China, um, and the ones that are there don't seem to have this elaborate sort of practice. Um, gardens were kind of already a thing in uh, Japanese culture. So the impact of the rock gardens um, sort of means kind of a melding of some traditional practices of giving nature manicures um, and sort of taking it to even further heights. Um, and, and some of the most famous gardens in Japan, um, some were designed, others possibly evolved kind of as a temple was like left to wilderness for a while and people came back and like, oh, that's great. Um, but yeah, it's definitely sort of another practice that is brought over and like really perfected um, and brought to a height in Japan. Um, so I previously mentioned these loosening social mores. Um, so Kawara Mora, one of the things uh, they were often sort of wanting to do was the construction work. Um, so here's a bunch of Kawara Mono. You can tell they're like half clothed. Uh, they're wearing weird outfits. Um, consulting with an elite court supervisor um, during the construction of uh, Kikino Tenmangu, which is a major shrine in Northwest Kyoto. Um, I talked to one person about the mass tea ceremonies. Um, that's the shrine where the tea ceremonies were held. Um, and here is a kind of small diagram of uh, an interior of a typical medieval building, um, medieval house. Um, it, the technical term is showing style. Um, so here's sort of all the elements that uh, go into that. And again, almost all of these are from the medieval period and don't uh, exist before then. Um, okay. Questions about any of that? Okay, we're gonna keep moving on. Gotta keep going. Actually, we're doing pretty hard. All right. Um, so, what happens? Why? Why do things sort of go haywire? Um, in in some respects, it's kind of a miracle that the Ashikaga Shogunate lasted as long as it did. Um, in other respects, uh, the Ashikaga, uh, through their own sort of uh, personal flavors of incompetence. Um, mm -hmm. kind of brought things on themselves. Um, so this is the sort of last shogun uh, Yoshi, uh, to wield sort of personal power, Yoshimasa. Um, it's important to note that the shogun actually continues to 1573, um, but after the Oni War starts, um, they basically are kind of like a local warlord in Kyoto. And they say they're in control of the rest of the country, but that's completely untrue. Um, and so the problem um, with the Ashikaga in particular and, and Yoshimasa um, was that they were seen as being very high-handed. Um, they were seen as being sort of too, uh, too happy to intervene in sort of their retainers' internal disputes. Um, and also, like, nobody really liked Yoshimasa that much. Um, as you can see from a later uh, source trying to make sense of this 10-year conflict in the city. Um, so in the first year of Oni, the country was greatly disturbed. Uh, the fault lay with the shogun, Yoshimasa. Instead of entrusting the affairs of the nation to his worthy ministers, Yoshimasa governed solely by the wishes of politically experienced wives and nuns. <laughs> These women did not know the difference between right and wrong, and they were ignorant of public affairs in the way of government. Um, so there's been a lot of talk about changing gender roles. Um, here's a pretty good example of sort of this late medieval attitude of like, women, no, not in government. Um, and the rest of this is actually kind of a pretty standard kind of trope of like what happens when things go bad and doesn't have a large, a lot of resemblance to like actual reality. Um, and in fact, also too, this sort of whole thing about the women is kind of more of a motif that is borne out by the documentary Red Her. Um, but like, you know, again, a standard way to write a story about a good government and good sovereign accepting the throne, a standard story to write about um, bad government and bad rulers. Um, so this is Yoshimasa's story fit into it afterward. Um, one of the more sort of proximal problems was that he in particular had a reputation for being more interested in um, aesthetic pursuits than in actual government, um, which is sort of embodied by Ginkakuji, one of his famous villas, his personal retreat. Um, so this is a dry Zen garden. Here's, a, here's, a, here's the pavilion itself, the silver pavilion. 
Um, it's not clear whether it was meant to be actually silvered or not, or whether the war stopped it. Um, but this garden will reflect moonlight at night, um, and would then illuminate, uh, there's also another sand uh, uh, tower structure here, would then illuminate the pavilion. Um, in any case, if they had silvered it, it would have tarnished during the Industrial Revolution, so maybe it's better they didn't. Um, but so, uh, Ashikaga in particular is sort of very famous as sort of having played the Koto while Kyoto burned, um, and not cared about things going bad around him. Um, so here's a shot, you can see how um, this is the rest of the city, this is the villa, it's actually facing the mountains away from the government. Um, the Shomo mansion is kind of down here on the other side of this hill. Um, and here's another uh, Ashikari extravagance, the King Kasuji, the Golden Pavilion, uh, was built by them. Um, so after the sort of uh, increasing discontent, uh, there's an inciting incident, it's all extremely complicated, I'm simplifying greatly. Um, so people sort of start fighting in the capital. Um, it touches off 10 years of fighting in and around Kyoto. Um, and um, it also touches off sort of essentially a conflict in the whole country um, as people increasingly decide that they are now kind of uh, going to just fight people directly for um, control of land, um, control of land rights. Um, and so the sort of classical structures are completely broken down. Um, everybody is sort of out to get what they can for themselves. Um, so the Senroku period, the catchphrase is Gekokjo, um, the lower overthrowing the higher. Um, extreme social mobility, um, it becomes a routine feature of life um, as sort of uh, classes, whole groups of people kind of decide like, I'm gonna go as far as I can. Um, other features which are familiar, I think, from textbooks, uh, the daimyo, um, these military lords, um, they, direct, they increasingly directly controlled sort of single contiguous political units. Um, those are called domains. Um, before, you know, one single power holder had rights to income from all over the country. Now, the important thing is, like, can you directly control this, like, single unit of land that is, you know, adjacent to itself? Um, they build castles. Um, these are originally fortified encampments um, that gradually sort of transform how space is organized in the countryside. Um, all of the modern castles, which are very pretty, is very tall, um, many of which are reconstructions, um, those all come from the Edo period. Um, the shogun actually ordered daimyo to construct them to use their money, um, so they couldn't use that money to rebel against the shogun. <laughs> um, as a tea, we've talked about the skin. Um, again, it was imported from China, um, and it's practiced by elites. During the Sengoku period, it's sort of appropriated by um, merchants who have increasing money and increasing sense of uh, self-legitimacy. Uh, um, so they sort of make it into this kind of meditative private ceremony. Um, and their taste is very anarchic uh, and idiosyncratic, rather than based on like the worth, the economic worth, you know, how much gold does this pot have on it? Um, as we saw with the asymmet asymmetry of the various tea bowls and such. Um, so, uh, a couple minutes left, I'm gonna keep going. Um, in terms of Kyoto, for example, after the Oni Wars, which burned 25% of the city, um, most of uh, people live in these shaded areas, and the black lines are fortified, uh, fortifications that are built around them in the streets. Um, the Imperial Palace falls into disrepair. Um, uh, the Imperial family only can obtain income from 34 estates, as opposed to like 250. Uh, every so often, you would see uh, court ladies kind of begging for people for coin in the streets um, when they couldn't uh, have money, to, when they didn't have money to eat. Um, so there's a sort of profound transformation, um, and also, you know, Kyoto at this point has extreme sort of social significance. The capital of flowers is destroyed um, is a common lament by people in this era, and it symbolizes sort of extreme dislocation. Um, what the hell is going on? Like, why are things not how they used to be? Um, and another, that, yes. Were each one of those little um, provinces its own kind of domain? Sorry. Um, right. In terms so this of the is war and battling states. This is the classical province map. Um, it has no relevance to the political map at the time, um, except that people would say, like, "Where are you from?" They'd say, "Oh, I'm from Awa province," because you know people understand that conceptually. Um, domains are shifting constant, constantly. Um, they're much smaller within provinces. Um, by the end, people have like whole multiple provinces under one person's control. Um, so the political map uh, doesn't match sort of the actual reality on the ground. But it's like that fragmented. Yeah, it's extremely fragmented. Um, 
And, and over time, you know, if you kind of, uh, if you start out with a lot of small players, there is kind of, kind of a consolidation through war, so you kind of get to a stage um, where the daimyo are sort of more of them, um, and they continue to fight with each other, and more and more of them lose. Um, and eventually they get to a point where they think, well, maybe we should kind of cooperate with, with each other um, and sort of try and ensure our <laughs> self-preservation as a group. Um, but before that, uh, we have sort of, in the midst of this period of extreme disconnection, disorder and interconnection, rather, um, this Europeans arrive in Japan with guns and ships and tempura. <laughs> um, so here they are in their Namban ships. They look very strange, don't they? They also smell very bad. Um, <laughs> So Japan adopts uh, technology and ideas pretty rapidly from the Spanish and the Portuguese, um, such as, um, for example, uh, metallurgy, gunsmithing, food, tempura, of course also Christianity. Um, and this, in fact, leads pretty directly to um, such things as uh, a huge increase in Japanese piracy throughout uh, East Asia, a um, huge increase for the first time of people who are Japanese living abroad, especially in the Philippines and then what's now Malaysia. Um, and then also, of course, to the sort of sole uh, historical example of Japanese uh, aggression outside the, outside the archipelago, which is the invasions of Korea uh, in the 1590s. There was warfare on the peninsula before recorded history, but we know less about it. Yeah. Europe brought tempura to Japan, not yeah. Japan brought tempura to Europe? Um, if yeah, Portuguese. In fact, it's a, it's a Portuguese, it's a Portuguese technique, um, which is why if you know Japanese, it's written weird, like ten, ten, the ten in tempura is written heaven, and then it's two hiragana, like pura, and it's like, that's weird, why is it like that? Um, because it's a Japanese pronunciation of the, of the Portuguese term. But it's, again, this is not a thing that is perfected in Japan, right? <laughs> They're the experts at fried things now. Yeah. Is arigado also from Portuguese? Uh, Obrigada. Uh, Arigato is possibly. Yeah. 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 yeah, that might also be, in fact, a thing. So the question was, is uh, obrigado, the Portuguese yes. uh, thank you, related to arigato, uh, the Japanese way? That's possible. I hadn't heard that before, but um, it could very well be. Um, yeah. yeah. So I asked, what was the exchange? So what did the Japanese give or influence to Portugal? Uh, well, the Portuguese are there because they want um, to trade things, and the Catholic missionaries are there because they want to convert people to Christ. Um, and the Catholic missionaries in particular are extremely perturbed by Japan and by um, the existence of Buddhism, which they basically decide must be the devil's religion, because in its structure, you know, with these established monasteries, nuns, nuns, that's nuns and monks together, um, and liturgical texts, you know, like this is clearly really close to Christianity, but it's not. You know, the devil must have set it up. Um, so they're very perturbed by Japan, and they're very into sort of uh, establishing a foothold there. Um, they do, in fact, uh, both in Kyushu and in Kyoto. Um, so I'm almost done. I keep going. Um, so here are some examples of tea culture. Um, Senmo Ryukyu, the guy who was a commit, uh, ordered to commit suicide, that's him. Um, here is a lovely asymmetrical tea bowl, a very weird shaped uh, water jar that's super awesome, clearly. Mm -hmm. um, it's from sort of this end uh, phase. And um, one thing that got thrown around sort of repeatedly uh, over the week was sort of this military dictatorship. Um, I would say no. Um, dictatorship, I think, has a specific meaning, and the shogunates don't match it. Um, so the Kamakura and the Ashikaga shogunates, and the Tokugawa one, too, for that matter, um, they're imperial authorized branches of government. Um, they're not separate from the imperial court. Um, the shogunates contested with established power centers. Um, uh, but as the old imperial state became increasingly dysfunctional, um, both the shogunate and the court were weakened, um, and other sort of new power holders became in power. Um, and also, sort of both the shogun and the court, their their struggles are con conducted in terms of their private rights. Um, everybody is trying to consolidate land rights um, as private holders, um, as opposed to public office uh, holders, um, including peasants. They also sort of get in on wanting to consolidate land rights. Um, and as the imperial court does lose power, um, others acquire it vis-a-vis -vis the shogun, rather than the shogun becoming more powerful. Um, and warrior culture emphasized, again, uh, this, these courtly cultural accomplishments, um, and, you know, as well as military prowess. It wasn't that arms were better than poetry. Um, and also, as well, um, an increasingly important military force is these major Buddhist temples. 
Um, they're already by the 1180s uh, sort of well known for having essentially private armies, these warrior monks who are basically trained thugs. Mm -hmm. um, and by sort of the Sengoku era as well, peasants are increasingly likely to take up arms. Um, so in the Sengoku era, everybody is potentially a warrior. It's a job description. It's not mm -hmm. kind of an inherited status group. Um, Toyotomi Hideyoshi grew up, you know, he was an Ill illegitimate peasant um, when he started out. Um, he became, he ended as dictator of Japan. He was actually kind of a dictator. <laughs> um, but, you know, uh, it wasn't, uh, uh, it was not a world by the end in which sort of birth mattered that much. Um, if you were good with a sword and, and canny, you could go pretty far. Um, but this was, in fact, sort of the problem. Um, so the middle of the three un unifiers, Toyotomi Hideyoshi, um, he sort of saw the, the Sengo problems and he decided to solve them. Um, so armed peasants uh, fighting people instead of uh, you know, farming and giving that income to other people who uh, deserve it. Um, so his solution was the sword hunt um, where everybody in Japan had to give up their weapons um, and all uh, the countryside was systematically stripped of, of weapons. Um, so this extreme social mobility is also a problem um, for exerting social control. Um, so his set the solution was to freeze the social order. Um, so, you know, everybody who was under arms in 1590 is given a choice in, in his armies and in other daimyo's armies. You know, you can go back to the land um, and become a farmer, in which case um, you are now legally a peasant. Um, but that's actually not that bad. It's the number two status group. Um, but you have to give up your arms. No more, no more arms ever. Um, and if you want to keep your arms, if you want to keep your being a samurai cool, but you have to go to the, into the castle towns, um, and you cannot live on the land. Uh, you cannot live amongst cultivators. You cannot be a farmer yourself. Um, Do kind they of, own the land? No. no. Um, samurai, once they go into castle towns, they are given the rights to income from uh, land that peasants are farming. There's no direct connection. Um, and the problem of the daimyo having uh, independent power bases in their own domains um, one of, the main solution is to break those daimyo links to their own lands um, by sending them, by reassigning them. Um, so Hideyoshi said, okay, you're the daimyo of here, now you're going to move to the other end of the country um, with your entire retainers. Nobody knows you, nobody there has any uh, pre-existing loyalty to you. Um, there's other strategies to sort of keep them kind of pacified. Um, and at the same time as this is happening, um, because of the daimyo competing with each other, um, there's this political breakdown, there's this military warfare going on, but it, at the same time, um, there's increasing economic interdependence um, within Japan. Um, commerce is growing rapidly because the domains can't provide everything they need, um, so daimyo are forced to trade with one another. Um, so even as there's sort of this extreme political fragmentation, the civil war, um, common culture and trade are providing sort of social links um, that prevent sort of total social dissolution. And that's the last slide. Um, so just to kind of go into a bit about the Tokugawa shogunate as sort of different from the medieval ones. Um, so the Tokugawa imposed this Neo-Confucian status order. Um, so there's four classes. I just didn't. It should be statuses because status and, status and class aren't the same. Um, so there's a four groups of people, uh, samurai, peasants, artisans, merchants, and that's in order of prestige and how valuable you were to society. Um, so this is a very large social group at the top, uh, eight to ten percent of the population. Um, in, in ancient, in ancien regime France, for example, it's like three percent. Um, so that's a lot of people. Uh, and half of them are women, again, because this is now an inherited legal status and not a job description. Um, so the shogun is definitely in charge. Uh, the imperial courts maintain to provide legitimacy, um, but they give a very reduced stipend. The shogun builds a very large castle in Kyoto, directly next to the imperial palace. To keep an eye on the, on the, on the emperor. Um, there's a federal aspect to the system. Uh, the shogunate claims some uh, spheres of its own, for example, foreign policy, cities, um, managing very limited amounts of foreign trade, which were allowed to go on. Um, but in their own domains, the daimyo have very broad authority. Um, again, samurai is now an inherited legal status. Um, as time went on, fewer samurai worked as administrators and bureaucrats. Um, and most had to obtain other sources of income as their income rights from 1600 decreased in value um, as the economy expanded. Um, so this commercial explosion uh, during this sort of Pax Tokugawa um, had the result of impoverishing the samurai as a group, um, but greatly enriched all of the commoners, especially merchants, um, which the samurai were very uh, unhappy about because, you know, according to the ideology, the merchants are supposed to be on the bottom, they're supposed to be very like, servile, and like, we have a samurai are supposed to be on top, but like, 
you know, we're broke. <laughs> we have to go become doctors or umbrella makers, you know, and they're walking around, they're rich. Um, so this is one of the sort of reasons that uh, this samurai discontent builds up the period. And over the period as well, um, because of the increasingly commercialized economy, you get class divisions emerging within status groups. Um, so there's rich samurai, maybe, uh, and poor samurai. There's rich farmers and poor farmers. There's rich merchants and poor merchants. Um, whereas before, uh, the idea was that sort of these status groups would be kind of economically uh, equal horizontally within themselves. Um, that's not what happens. Uh, and so in some ways, the Tokugawa shogunate is kind of the most isolated era of Japan um, because foreign trade is tightly regulated. Um, there is not sort of one document that says we're going to close the country. Um, it's just sort of a set of interrelated policies. They kick out the Christians because it's seen as being uh, not amenable state control. Um, but because there's no military expenditures, um, all that sort of extra sur surplus can be put into the economy. Um, and as a side effect of various so shogunal policies, you do get this commercial explosion. Um, and popular culture reaches new heights. Um, all of the sort of Edo period art we have, arms and armor, ukiyo-e prints, all of that, um, is because of this fantastic economic surplus, this increasingly commercialized society. Um, you do also get rapidly rising literacy and other things. Um, so this society is very well set up to make the jump um, to modernity and industrialization um, once uh, Japan does sort of re-enter a uh, sort of larger sphere in the 1850s. Um, they do so, again, and this Karen was talking yesterday about um, artifacts and provenance. Um, you know, Japan, when they do re-enter the world markets in the 1850s, and especially in the 1870s, um, they've been on their own sort of personal silver standard. Silver is very low priced in the world at large. This is why we get Japanese made and sort of this large scale, large scale export of uh, art and art objects to Europe and America. It's because Japan is desperately broke. Uh, people in Japan are desperately broke. There's whole stories about, you know, you would pass a foreigner street and they'd be like, hey, I like your, you know, your toggle on your kimono. And they're like, how much? Do you want it? Take it. Like, give me, you know, give me better foreign money, um, especially gold, um, as opposed to silver, which was extremely uh, low value at the time. But because of this commercial explosion in the Edo period, um, rising rates of literacy, you got, uh, all of these interrelated factors, um, it does, again, mean that Japan is very well poised to industrialize uh, and to become this sort of powerhouse in Asia and this empire in Asia. In Asia. Um, and the Wigan reading, which I assigned, um, which is the introduction to her first book, which is really good, um, is about kind of looking at um, geog geography through a historical lens. People asked how we can talk about geography from documents and art. Um, she does some of that in, in the introduction, looking at this sort of small region in Japan um, that was sort of a part of a diverse economy in the Edo period, and then as Japan as a whole re-enters the world economy, um, becomes increasingly export, uh, oriented towards one, producing one good, silk, um, for the export market, and then becomes very directly connected to sort of global economic factors in ways that hurt people who live there. Um, yeah, so that's it. Um, yeah. Yes, I can go back on slide. We can take like one or two questions. And again, I'll send these to Devin and he'll put them on uh, the website. So any other questions about any of that? Yes. Oh, well, Hideyoshi, not samurai. Not by birth. Right. Um, but so like how was... Samurai was just like job, you know, like right. anybody could pick up a sword. But, he was, but how come he wasn't, how could he, he wasn't a show, shogun? And like well, that, whole, so that, whole com that whole thing, yeah. Yeah, um, he isn't shogun partly because the, la the shogunate was abolished uh, in the 1570s. Um, the last shogun dies and nobody bothers to appoint a new one because it's completely because pointless. In fact, Nobunaga shogun. was like, no more shoguns. Um, Nobunaga was the predecessor of Hideyoshi. Oh, no, no, no. Um, he also doesn't ask the emperor to make him shogun. Um, he starts using a different term, taiko, um, which is, very grandiose, it is not a term that other people use. Uh, they, there is some evidence that he kind of maybe wanted to become emperor in his own right. Um, certainly, you know, as far as we can tell, he invaded Korea because he wanted to invade China and like become kind of king of the world maybe. <laughs> um, so he's not shogun because he didn't want to be. Um, Tokugawa Ieyasu takes the title of shogun um, partly as a way to sort of reassure people, like, no, I'm not Toyotomi, like, I'm not Hideyoshi, I don't want to make myself, like, king over everybody, um, I'm going to take this kind of traditional title, and, like, his regime operates through this sort of established precedent of a shogunate. So how did, how did, how did 
Tokugawa rise to power under so um, when he, when very he briefly, uh, Hideyoshi was one of Nobunaga's kind of lords. Nobunaga right. dies. Nobody, everybody's afraid of him. He gets assassinated. Toyotomi right. sort of wins out over other daimyo. Um, Ieyasu was one of uh, Toyotomi Hideyoshi's five sort of lieutenant lords. Right. Um, when, when Hideyoshi dies, um, his son is five years old. Um, these five lords are tasked with maintaining the regime until the kid grows up. This is a fantasy. It's not going right. to happen. Uh, there's also a lot of people who say that the kid couldn't possibly have actually been Hideyoshi's, but that's another story and not relevant because um, people treat him like he's, you know, he's acknowledged as as Toyotomi's son. Um, so Ieyasu um, and uh, two of the other lords sort of. Uh, band together under Ieyasu, and they're like, we're going to overthrow the, Hide the Toyotomi. Um, so the other two lords fight for the Toyotomi. Um, they have this battle in 1600, in 1600 at Sakigahara. They Tokugawa win. Um, Fifteen years later, they have another battle at Osaka um, when the son of Hideyoshi is grown up, and he's like, no, really, I'm going to, no, oh, okay. it doesn't work. He, he, he's beheaded. Um, Are they going to commit suicide? One or the other. It doesn't work. Um, that's sort of one of the last major battles. And that's partly why sometimes you'll see the, e the Edo period dated from 1615. Instead of 16. Yeah. Okay. Um, but Tokugawa Iyasu was in control from 1600. So, yeah. And in 1603 is when he technically takes the title of Shogun, which is where that date comes from. But, okay. One last question. I was just wondering if you can specify what time period the Toyotomi policies were for pacifying peasants. Was that before the Edo, or yeah. where was this is that? 15, this is like 1590, essentially. Okay, so before. Um, Thank yeah. you. So like 10 years before the Edo period. Thank um, you. So kind of the end of like the medieval problems. Thank you. Yeah. Um, but then, you know, another reason he invades Korea is there's all these samurai, and they're used to fighting. Um, now who do we fight when we've, you know, subjugated, when we, we've reunified all of Japan? Well, okay, let's go fight uh, Joseon, Korea. Um, unfortunately for the Koreans. Um, there's that line about Mexico, you know, uh, so far from God, so close to the United States. Korea, in, in some respects, has played that same, uh, same role with respect to Japan. They're kind of very convenient um, when Japan has felt like uh, exercising its military force. Okay, um, so we're gonna end there, gone on too long. Thank you all.